Uh, hello, this is David Birch at Star Pass School of Navigation uh, with the first of what will be maybe three videos that will be combined into an article on uh, storm avoidance. Um, looking at some, reviewing some of the basics very quickly, but then getting to some very specific analyses, uh, bringing up the subtleties and the real crucial matters that uh, come to play when you're actually sitting there in the boat uh, with some uh, storm information and indications uh, at hand. So just a real, real quick review here, uh, just uh, starting out with some rougher sketches and then getting into some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, computer analysis of real data. Um, but now, here's a simple case. In the northern hemisphere, there's a low with the winds going around it counterclockwise and into the low. This side of the storm, and the storm's moving that way, and this side has stronger winds uh, for several reasons. One is uh, that um, the motion of the storm is this way, and it adds to the circular winds going this way, whereas on the other side, the motion, the relative motion of the storm uh, cancels or, or diminishes the winds on this side of the storm. However, we shall see a very important factor here that almost everywhere that such lows uh, in these tropical storms or hurricanes develop, this side of it here, or the dangerous side, so-called dangerous side, will have over here a big high. And the isobars of this high are going to pack up these winds. So these winds are going to be stronger on this side for another reason. And, and also a very fundamental point um, to keep in mind and also to help you remember which side is dangerous. Uh, that is the winds of see if you're up here in front of your boats up here in front of this storm these winds are pushing you in the direction of the storm whereas these winds are pushing you away from the storm so that's a point one and that's all uh, that, that's a very basic but there's a several nuances here uh, notice here that if we're in this circulation I really should have drawn another couple isobars here but we're assuming, and this will show up in the real world case, we are assuming that we are indeed in the region of closed isobars, circular, round, closed isobars. Up here, up here somewhere, the isobars aren't closed. They're coming down here and wandering off, going someplace. So we're in the circular, uh, and you don't know that offhand unless you have a weather map. And the other thing, too, is... This type of analysis is mostly important when you, for some reason, don't have a weather map. You don't have the information, and you're having to judge this all from your own on the boat with the things you can detect. And, indeed, the uh, motivation for coming back to this analysis came from exactly an event like that, which unusual circumstances left the boat uh, without the weather information with a very quickly approaching storm. And that led us to think about this stuff and to re-look at the practical matters. But look at the wind shift. So one thing that's happening, these isobar, the pressure is getting lower. We'll look at this, see here, like 10, 1,000, 104, 108, 116. So the pressure is going down. So as this thing approaches you, one thing that's happening to both sides of the storm, the pressure is dropping. Now when you're watching the wind, the wind is going to behave differently on the two sides. On this side, you see, what I've done here is just imagine this system driving across the boat. We're going to do it later. We'll use a weather program and we'll actually move the storm across the boat, which makes it a little more clear. But in this case, this is a picturesque. We have this storm here. And so this, as this system moves across this boat, this boat first sees wind one, then it sees wind two, wind three. Now here, the, the guy's gone by. Right, but look at here, and the only way, the easiest way to see the actual shift, it's a little tricky here, unless you're accustomed to this sort of thing, but I've just put all the arrowheads together. So there's wind one, wind two, wind three, wind four. So you see what's happening on this side of the storm, once you are inside the circular, the, the closed isobars, the wind is veering, it's shifting to the right. Now, on the other hand, you look at wind one, wind two, wind three, wind four, that on the so-called navigable side, 
the wind is doing the opposite. It's starting here, this wind is one, this wind is two, and so forth. So the wind is backing. So on this side of the storm, if you're on this side of the path of the circular low going by, the wind will be backing. So we have that information. We have a dropping wind and we have a backing wind. And we have a, probably a building wind for sure on this side. Not clear over here, but it's probably building to some extent here. Again, we have two real nice examples to look at in detail. One is Tropical Storm Claudette in the, um, in the Atlantic, the northeast waters of the Atlantic. And the other is just from a couple days ago. Um, that's a Hurricane Guillermo. Guillermo. And so we have both those data to look at. So that's that. Now, so that's the end of that picture for now. We'll come back to that. And then here is just uh, another just reminder of the old buys ballot law, which is another way to point to the low. Or, you know, when you're in the circular isobars, when you're within the closed isobars, you are indeed pointing at the, the center of the low. When you're just somewhere randomly in space out here, you're pointing in the direction of lowest pressure, which may not necessarily be the direction to the storm. So that's a big difference. You're always pointing not to the low, but you're pointing to the direction of the lowest, lowest local pressure. So you see, if you put your up here number one, this is the guy, he's, he's facing that way. That's his little nose right there, his nose. And then uh, his back to the wind, his left hand out, and then crank it forward about two points, 20, 30 degrees. And then you're pointing to the direction of the low. Then a little while later at point two, you back to the wind, a little forward, and you're pointing that way. So you can, if you're sitting there hove two or something, um, uh, watch the direction, of the, uh, the motion of the storm on, on either side. That's the way that works. And this picture is there to pause and look at and think about. And then, um, but you could heave to or you could move. One of the things we're going to talk about is the option of to move. And if you do move, which way to go? That's the end of that picture. Now, I just want to refer to our textbook, uh, Modern Marine Weather. That's in uh, section 4.7. And this is here. Excuse me. And this has a better pictures than those rough sketches. Here's the sides of the storm like that, a navigable and dangerous side. That's right in the northern hemisphere, but it's reversed in the southern. Let's not deal with that now. One at a time, one hemisphere at a time. Northern hemisphere, storms going that way. Dangerous sides on the right. The wind is, what's the wind doing? We'll see in a minute, we know. Well, here's another factor. Here's what I wanted to talk about. These storms here, this is a Pacific high, say in this case, or if you rotate this around, it's going north like the Claudette was, this was this high over here was on this side, and it's a sort of a remnant of the, like the Azores high or something like that. But this contributes to making the isobars closer on this side. So it's not just a relative motion, it's these packed up isobars. So that's shown schematically, these are a little farther apart than these, in southern hemisphere, same way. This is just blasting through here. Oh, and here's a, here's a little better picture. This is from the iBook version of our textbook. We have uh, e-books in all formats. This, I think, is, uh, yeah, this iBook. Here's the case here with, again, the same thing, showing on the right-hand side the wind is veering, and on here it's backing. And in this picture, it lets you show all different cases like that. So that's in there. Now, we're going to come back to this, but this, this is now the section where it talks about which is the best way to move if you decide you're going to move, you're going to try to. Uh, the big thing with these storms, and we have that in another part of the book, the big factor is to get as far away from the center as possible. That's going to generally be in your best interest by far, avoiding the deep storm winds. I mean, even another 20, 40, 60 miles is huge, huge. So um, that's the thing to look at. Just keep in mind that on the right-hand side, you may get out of the 50 knots, but you may still be, you can travel quite a ways and still be in 25, 30 knots. We'll see that. We'll see that in a minute. And this, we'll come back to this formula, actually not in this video, but in another one. And this is going to tell us which way to move, uh, which is the optimum direction to move, and I'll come back to that. So those are the background. Oh, that's it. Now going somewhere else. Another story. It's Hurricane Sandy. That's a, another thing in the book. And here's the case. Uh, 
Here's the first case we're going to analyze in detail, but so the videos don't get too long, I'm going to stop there and then we'll come back and we'll first look at the Hurricane Guillermo, Guillermo in uh, August, about August 3rd. This, well, here it is, August 3rd. And these are the GFS winds. But for the time being, we'll stop there with this video part one.